Gabriel's Gospel Grace, changing lives and kingdom building one stone at a time. Well, good morning to you and welcome back after a short recess this last past week. I hope it's been an interesting time for yourselves in a positive way. I know that I've had a lot of people coming to me recently that are either entering new relationships or in a renewal of relationships. And I thought that's quite a fascinating thing to be happening at this time of year. But there does seem to be a gathering of people coming together. And of course, there's no better coming together than entering that of wedded bliss. And uh, that's kind of where our topic is still going this week. So let's bring in our guests and continue with our topic of marriage co covenant even. So uh, let's bring in the Sharps. Hello to you both. Good Hello. morning to you, Gabe. Welcome back. Okay. Nice to see you again. Yes, and you. So the topic this week is uh, marriage covenant. And obviously, I know you've actually conducted a few weddings and things yourself. And we've talked previously about sort of couples counselling and things. So from your own perspective, how do you see marriage covenant versus just secular marriage? Yes, well we talk about secular marriage um a lot of people don't get married at all today do they no that's true um, and you often find people talking about their partners um oh, do you remember gal when you were having joshua 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 was being born in the hospital or josh a gal was just about to give birth and the midwife comes along and takes a, a sort of a, a name and address and everything and name of partner what's your partner's name what's your partner's address and um can you remember what you did you were no because i was on gas so... All right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, she... G gail here comes some revelation <laughs> she struck out the name partner do you remember now this is my ian is not my partner he is my husband all right amen <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, uh, it, it irritates me, to be honest with you, that when people call one another their partners. Yeah. Um, and I, I was in the hairdressers a couple of years back, and uh, I, I was, chap was cutting my hair, and he was going on about his partner this, his partner that. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll play that game. <laughs> so uh, I said, well, my covenant partner. <laughs> um, and I are going to do this, and my covenant partner are going to do that. And my covenant partner thinks this and that, and I'm going out for dinner with my covenant partner. So I was using the word covenant, and yeah, he, he stops cutting my hair for a few moments, and he says, <laughs> I, "What do you mean when you talk about your covenant partner? Well, she's the one that I'm married to, <laughs> the one that I promised never to leave nor forsake, uh, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health." for better, for worse. Uh, and, you know, that is what I understand marriage to be. Um, I often think that people often say to me, well, marriage is a piece of paper. <laughs> uh, why, why bother? Uh, and I think to myself, well, you don't understand what marriage is. If you think marriage is a piece of paper, um, you, you have a misconception of what the marriage covenant is all about. Um, and I remember having a conversation around the canteen table when I, I worked for Sainsbury's with one of my colleagues and they were talking about the problems that they were having with their partner. And um, I says, and, and he, he was saying, she doesn't want to marry me. She just wants to live together. And I said, yeah, she wants to leave the back door open. Yeah. Um, that's what, that's what, um, if, if she really loved you, she'd get married. Yeah. But because she doesn't want to marry you, it demonstrates to me that she doesn't really love you. And he thought for a moment and he says, I think you're right there. Mm. And actually, I think people don't get married because they don't want to commit themselves. And because they don't want to commit themselves, it really demonstrates to me that there isn't love there um so yeah yeah i mean i i see a sort of hybridized version of what you've just said and it's really just getting to the crux of what you've just said which is the problem is a lot of people 
want somebody in their life. And I think that's one of the things I see about partnership. Partnership often means they lead very separate lives, but come together and live together. So they're mm. almost like just one level above friends. But I think that's the key, isn't it? That when it comes to marriage, this is when it's not just a friend. It's not just someone you spend time with. This person is the person you're supposed to be with. Mm. And I think that's what's lacking. I think there is a sense of filling the void with somebody in your life. And that's what a lot of partnership relationships are. So yes, there's a sexual content, they live together, they may share resources, they enjoy each other's company, but that's not the level of commitment. And I think that's why they won't make the commitment. I mean, it's a mm -hmm. bit like, um, you know, if you're buying a new car, it's interesting, isn't it? Because there is a level of commitment to that. You know, financially you're about to invest, but is it really wise to buy a Ferrari and live where I am, where it's going to be potholes a foot deep? And constant, you know, muck on the road and everything is, you know, if you were going to make that commitment to that car, you're probably going to relocate. And mm. I think when it comes to relationships, like you said, it is about there is no commitment or the love's not deep enough. And I think you're right. In a lot of cases, there has to be a back door. And I think the two reasons for that are one, they've had bad experiences either through their parents or personal. Or, of course, the more obvious one, which I think is the main one, is they're not that in love with that person because they won't commit to them because it's not the person there that god has willed for them to have in their lives mm. so i think that's that kind of combines exactly those traits that you've observed but i do think this is still the issue that in the partnership relationship um it, it is a little bit loose slack there is a lot of flexibility to kind of go off and do your own thing and i think that's why people then say well marriage is a piece of paper because a lot of them people got married with that same partner mentality, if yes. that makes sense. So I think, and again, I'm, I'm sure that's what we're probably going to move on to now, is that I, I, a lot of people get married for the wrong reasons. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, the, the number one reason for getting married is because God wants, to get, wants you to be married. Yeah. That might seem obvious to us as believers, but, you know, when, when a couple might come to Gal and I and say they want to get married, why do you want to get married? well uh, we have share same the same interests we we like doing this together and uh, we complement one another and there's a romantic love there's a there's an eroticism perhaps that they want to uh satisfy and that they can't wait to jump into bed with one another so um they know as christians they can't do that unless they're married so that's maybe one of the reasons why they want to get married but primarily it's because it's god's will that they get married they are the perfect partner that he has got for them yeah gail you obviously do a lot with women's ministry and i know you've touched on in the past that there seems to be more commitment for relationships coming from the women than the men but do you find this is a topic that comes up often that they they might be looking for commitment or do you often find women that are feeling pressured to go into commitment how do you find it um, I, I, the women I deal with probably tend to um, mostly already be married and perhaps have problems within their relationship um, more so than the younger end who are, who are looking for relationships. They're just the, the, the ladies that I tend to deal with. Um, but I, I, you know, as, as I see the marriage covenant, I, I would like to bring in Ephesians 5, 31, 32, which says, if I may read it, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I'm sure other people on your program have already read that scripture. Um, but the marriage covenant, that scripture is telling us that the marriage covenant is a picture of the union we have with God in Christ. And okay. so when we come to look at marriage, and indeed, um, you know, when I'm talking to ladies, anybody really, um, that's the picture I want to keep in mind. How does God love me now that I have received Christ as my saviour? How does God relate to me? How does he love me? His love is unconditional. His love is, um, it, let me read another scripture, yep. which, which speaks of how God loves me as his child. And this is Hebrews 13, 5, and it's taken from the Amplified Classic version, all right? So it's a little bit wordy, but I love the Amplified Classic. It's such yeah. a, good, um, a good translation 
when you're just looking at specific scriptures because it brings out the meaning so well. Yeah. And this scripture, Hebrews 13, 5, says, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, nor relax my hold on you, assuredly not. They're God's words to us. That's his love for us. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to let us down. His love for us, his covenant love for us, is absolutely rock solid. We can be absolutely confident in that relationship that he loves us, he's not judging us, he's not rejecting us, he absolutely loves us and will always love us. He will always be there for us, he will never leave us or forsake us. And that is the picture that I want to bring into the marriage covenant, which is a picture of our covenant yes. with God in Christ. And yeah. that is such a beautiful picture, and it takes on a whole new meaning than just a partnership. This is a covenant relationship. So if that relation, if, with, that, with God loving me in that way, how does that make me feel? Does that make me want to reject God and run off and flirt with the world and worldly ways? No, it does the opposite of that. And my security in that love makes me want to serve him more and run after him more. And so, Ian, my covenant, my, my marriage covenant, um, you know, in my marriage covenant, he is called to love me as Christ loved the church. Same picture. How does his love then make me feel? Does it make me feel I want to reject him and run off and flirt with somebody else? No, it does the opposite of that. Just as God's love draws me in, Ian's love draws me in because I know I'm accepted. I know he won't leave me. I know that I'm loved and accepted. And that love draws me into the relationship. It makes me want to love him more, not less. Amen. 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 So, so as we, as we, see the relationship we have with God and how much he loves us, his unconditional love for us, and then realize that is the picture God wants us to bring into our marriage as Christians. That is such a positive and affirming um, thing that strengthens our marriage. Let me give you one more scripture here. This is Ecclesiastes 4.12, not to do with marriage particularly, but it is such a wonderful scripture on what we're dealing with. Yeah. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. And of course, two of us together are stronger than one, yeah. but then it's not just <clears throat> us two, it's God as well in this marriage, and three of us, that's even stronger. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> so that so that would be a, a big distinction between a secular marriage and a Christian marriage. Um, because the, the husband and the wife, the husband is modeling his marriage on Christ's love for the church. Mm. Um, and, and it's a case of, um, you know, when, when, whenever Gal and I have to counsel people who are having trouble with their marriage, it's usually because one, one of the partners, <laughs> the spouse or the wife, that the husband or the wife want their own way. Yeah. Um, but love is not selfish. Um, it's because one of the, either the husband or wife are, are um, you know, impatient, aren't being kind. You know, and, and one of the things that we have to do is say, go home and read 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> <laughs> And ask yourself whether whether this is your marriage, yeah. Um, uh, and of course, um, you, you, this is impossible with a secular marriage because God is not there. God is a, is a concept that is not there, and, and a marriage is sort of something that you have not to give, but perhaps be in for what you can get. Yeah. Um, uh, but but a Christian marriage is about what you can give, mm. and you know one Corinthians thirteen is love, love, love. Yeah, we're going to say I think we can expand on what we've just said about the secular and actually bring it into the Christian world as well. Because what's fascinating, especially when Gail were going through that, was the recognition that in some marriages it is ownership, 
I think I hear that more often than not. That's why it becomes a, a chain around someone's neck, because once we get married, I belong to someone. That's part of the mentality. But coming back to the Christian side of that, expanding on that same point, the marriage, as you say, covenant, should reflect the relationship with God. But it's amazing how many of these marriages feel oppressed, controlled, tested, challenged. And testing is a big one. I know there's plenty of relationships that test each other all the time for fidelity and all these other things. But then even in Christian marriages, this is what's happening all the time. But then isn't that also reflecting people's perception of their relationship with Christ? Is Indeed. that part Indeed. of this problem that, yeah. yes. again, if, if we said that your marriage should model your relationship with God, but it's an abusive relationship seem, some people seem to have. I mean, before this 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 episode, we were talking about how I'd uh, met someone recently who told me all these horrible things that are happening to them. And they said, oh, you know, but but I have faith in God. I know he's just testing me. That's like an abusive husband. You know, well, I, I've... You know, I tried to do all these things right, but I know he's just testing me just to prove how good I am. And I had to correct him and say, no, that's not the father. <laughs> the father's love would not put you through that. That's the enemy trying to come in between you and your love for God. So exactly that problem in relationships. So fundamentally, is is part. Of, so even if people understand the covenant of marriage is really one of the issues and probably a focus then is the couple need to work on their relationship with God. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's it's our relationship with God is not what we do for him. It's all about what Christ has already done for us. And until we get that foundational truth and sad to say so many Christians don't understand that. They know Jesus died on the cross for them, but they somehow think they've got to add to that some good works. I've got to read my Bible, I've got to pray, I've got to go to church, otherwise God won't accept me or he won't answer my prayers. But that is not the gospel. The gospel is God has already done everything that is needed when jesus died on the cross for us he loves us unconditionally and some people find that hard to accept but we don't add anything the covenant was not between us and god it was between god and jesus and we become or partake of that covenant to become part of it when we receive jesus as our lord and savior but we don't then add to that covenant because that covenant has already been completed by jesus on the cross and it's not what we do or anything to do with us it's what jesus did and now god accepts us because of christ so that is a wonderfully freeing message and if we can understand our relationship with god that truth from god's word then it will free up and help us in our marriage covenants our marriage relationships amen, amen. Well, when you were just reeling off that, that early bit of your statement just there i just had deja vu with some of the clients i've had um, and the way they were rolling out is I do the cooking, I do the cleaning, I look after the children, I do this, I take care of their house, I make sure he's got his shirt signed and another. It's a works based faith. Mm. It's a works based love. You know, I do all this for my husband and, and this is to win his affection and love. And like you said, that's not how our relationship with God should be. And it certainly shouldn't be the relationship with your spouse. Mm. And And. I don't know. I'm just thinking of something. I, I, I will probably share it. I, it's, 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 it's close to our family. I hope the rest of my family won't mind me sharing this. But it, it's a commitment. It's a love that continues, even though it might not be reciprocated. Yeah. Um, my, my dear father, um, it was quite sad circumstances. Um, my mum and dad had been married, what was it, 60 years? I think it was 60 yeah, they years. Were. Yes, they got the card from they the got Queen. Got the card from the Queen, yeah. They've been married yeah. for 60 years. And in, in my in my, in my, my mother's senior years, she had quite serious dementia and, and she lost her mind. And it was difficult. I, my dad had looked after her for, for a long time, but he was getting old in years himself and he was finding it increasingly more difficult to look after her yeah and so um he was compass mentis he was he was as sharp as a penny and 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 and, and you know nothing missing at all uh, maybe his health was a bit more uh challenging physical health, yeah. physical health mm. but he was very sharp uh, but my, my mother was had lost it completely yeah. lost it and uh, he, he would be patient with her and trying to explain things to her and she still wouldn't get it. And 
he'd, he'd there, keep making the cups of tea, he'd keep doing the cooking, he'd, he'd, he'd start washing twice a day because um, the clothes needed cleaning that often. Uh, and the decision came that, Dad, I think Mum needs to go into a into a nursing home. You you can't you can't cope. Can't keep this up. You can't cope. Keep this up. Uh, and he says, "Well, I can't do that. I promised always to look after mm. my wife. I can't do that." And it was it was clearly that it, it couldn't go on like it was. Uh, but he wasn't going to allow his wife in, go into a nursing home and he stay in the bungalow where they'd lived. Uh, and the decision was made that they were both going to go into a nursing home. Right. So my mother went into a nursing home, specialist for dementia. All the clients were very well past uh, the stage that an ordinary old people's home would take them. Mm. Uh, um, a lot of them were just sort of non compass mentis. And my dad shared a room in the nursing home with my mother and my dad was the only sane patient yeah. or client in the whole of the home. Wow. And he, the only people that he talked to or could talk to uh, were the other visitors visiting other, other clients, their mum and dad and, and the staff, but sacrificially mm. he gave for his wife. A commitment that was was there till his his dying day. Mm. Yeah, and dearie me, I you know I think about uh, um, the people that would have walked away mm. and said, "This is too much. Uh, let's just uh, put a put my put my wife in a nursing home and let me just enjoy the last years of my life on my own, yeah. without the responsibility." Wow. But such was his commitment and love. Mm. Uh, that, that he, he he spent the last two years of his life in a nursing home. It was it was smelly. It it, it was it was awful, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it really I was. mean, there, there were a lot of disper disturbed people in there. And when you went to visit, I mean, we found it hard when we went to visit because you know there would be people calling out and crying and shouting, maybe swearing. Sometimes you'd find people who'd taking the clothes off and, and uh, not made it to the toilet, should we put it like that? And, you know, so it was a very difficult environment. And he even got a black eye once from one of the other people. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah, because there was a bit of violence. I mean, the obviously, yeah. as soon as something kicked off, the, the carers would step in, but you never knew when something mm. was going to happen. So, yeah, he, he got but, punched. <laughs> but what we're getting back to, Gabe, is is is, is a commitment. Mm. The covenant. Of, of, of love, mm. of covenant, yeah. you know, mm. uh, you know, he had remembered his marriage vows mm. that that for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, in sickness and in health. Mm. Amen. And, and he he was he sacrificially gave, mm. and it's an example of how sacrificially Jesus gives for us. Amen. Yeah. And, and that Jesus doesn't walk out the door when the going gets tough. Jesus right. doesn't walk out the door when when it's difficult for us and 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 um, and we're not reciprocating that love in in the perfect way um yeah well, i mean what it, it, that, i mean that's a shining example though of exactly how that love covenant should be and also how to measure love yeah. um i was reminded then of a, a relationship i started with a teacher and it all looked promising on paper it looked like we could we could flourish and go forward from girlfriend and boyfriend and then a conversation came up one evening about if i was to get a motorbike you know just had these random conversations come up and i said but what if anything happened what if i was in an accident and very clearly straight away she said well um well i wouldn't know what to do in that scenario so i, I can't answer that i said so if i was in an accident you wouldn't be able to look after me so well, I don't know until it happens, and that that was the red flag. <laughs> that was the moment. So I probed a bit deeper and said, "Well, if I was sick or anything, how how would that be in the future? Let's assume we went forward and we got married and all the rest of it. Well, well, I don't know. I I, I can't answer that. I mean, I probably couldn't. I couldn't do it today. And I just remember saying, "Well, that's it. Then it's ended." And 
she found that really hard to understand. And I know we, we met up a few times after and she said, but it's going so well. I said, but it's going to go nowhere. <laughs> if yeah. you can't understand the, the, the concept of loving someone in sickness and in health, then there is no future. And I still remember, I think the biggest shock for me was realising someone still wanted to pursue something when clearly there was no fruitful ending to it. I, I think that still sort of surprised me today. But in a way, that's been an eye-opener to a lot more secular yeah. relationships, which is, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. we live in the now, enjoy yeah. it while it's here. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's not worry about the future. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But that's not security. And like you say, the covenant yeah. of marriage, it is, that, like you say, it's the security of with God. Um, I mean, in a way, interesting, I'm coming on to this topic. It's the guarantee, not that you need it, but it's there. And I know we've just been having this little story, so I don't know if you want to share this story with us, Ian, but I think it is, we talk about foundations, don't we? And you've got a foundational story, I suppose, when you think about it. Yeah, so I was just sharing, sharing with Gabe just before we came on air um, that um, I put my foot through the kitchen floor uh, the other week just by the sink. I'd like to say that I was washing up, but I was making a cup of tea. But well, this floor feels a bit spongy, and I put a little bit more pressure on it, and it, it gave way. And uh, I pulled up the carpet tiles, and there was woodworm. We previously had woodworm in 2017. And... Um, so, we made a few phone calls and this chap came and I look at it and he spent an hour um, um, measuring up and uh, uh, I thought to myself, goodness knows how much this is going to cost. So we had a conversation about how much it was going to cost and he went through all the, all the bits and pieces of how much wood had doubled in price and uh, he said two thousand pounds. You know, he said it very quickly, as if as if I didn't hear it the first time, to make it not sound as bad as it was. Two thousand, about two thousand, a couple of grand's worth of work here. And uh, he says, "But what about the paperwork that you've got from from 2017?" So I, I, I found it out, and he says, "Oh, he says you're guaranteed from the previous work that we did from on your house. It is guaranteed for thirty years, and so it's going to cost you nothing." <laughs> Um, so not only is it the law's provision, but, you know, there is the guarantee. Uh, and so often guarantees aren't worth the um, paper that they're written on. Yeah. Um, you know, a lifetime guarantee, whatever does a lifetime guarantee, it means it's a guarantee as long as it works. Uh, and when it doesn't work, it's the end of its life. So a lifetime guarantee doesn't mean anything to a lot of people. But yes, right. God's guarantee is eternal. It's everlasting. And um, yeah, and it's a guarantee that if anything goes wrong, he'll always be there. Well, I'm going to say in that story, I mean, like you say, the floor is a foundation. When you obviously moved into the house as a married couple, you know, you had good foundations. And then through no fault of your own, there's been erosion in those foundations. But that contract was taken out. And of course, now there's full restoration. And I think, again, that's fascinating that when it comes to covenant of marriage, many things happen. I mean, obviously, that's what Gail's touching on is so many things happen within that covenant of marriage and relationships. And I know, obviously, Andrew and Jasmine certainly referred to theirs that the covenant meant that even if the other side don't honour it, you still honour your side of that covenant. Mm -hmm. And and that guarantee, that security of knowing that things may go wrong in life. It could be the enemies coming against us. There's temptations. I mean, we that's the whole point. We're not perfect in this world. But the marriage should be secure and strong enough that it can be restored. And I think that example of, you know, yeah, you entered a contract. And, of course, a covenant stronger than a contract. But that's not what we can find in secular relationships where and of course we go to the other extreme now which is of course where people will get married but with another contract and that contract is a prenuptial agreement yes which says well what's yours is yours what's mine is mine and uh and we'll go forward in this kind of uh, half-hearted contract scenario and again it what it really shows is that god is not part of that no if god was in it then you wouldn't feel the need to and of course i do know you know there are relationships um i've been through them other people have where people get burnt and therefore there's caution but again if it's god intended yes 
then then you know that that's automatically overridden and that faith in your partner should come from the same faith you have in christ so on that note we're about to come to a close i'd like you both to uh to finish on any final comments we have on the covenant of marriage and even more so if we've got any people considering marriage because i know that there's a lot of young people now who i think i've mentioned it before they're, they're in a place where perhaps their parents or even step parents have got divorced but now they want something stronger than what the world offers and they are now looking at marriage again and i know there's a lot of uh, a whole influx of new christians uh, younger in looking at marriage so what advice would you give them going forward from that position um well if well i'm just thinking of the covenant i have with god i'm thinking how what did it take for me to be able to enter into that covenant relationship with my father and the word that comes up to me is sacrifice the sacrifice of jesus on the cross and therefore i would say as you think of the marriage covenant yes we think of love yes we think of commitment yes we think of you know all these lovely things and they are part of it but the word sacrifice has got to be in there amen amen and ian and then I think just to underline that you get married for the right reasons. Um, people get married for all kinds of reasons. Um, some people get married because they're pregnant. <laughs> um, other people marry, get married because they want to jump into bed with one another as, as soon as possible and make it right before God. Other people just want to get married because they've just got a romance and they just like the idea of it. and want to settle down and do their own thing but again it's all about god if it's not god's will then don't get married he has to be the reason why anyone gets married he has the perfect partner for uh young people our son joshua he's um what is he now 24 um there is the perfect partner for him i know my one of my nieces didn't get married until she was 30 um uh, another niece didn't get married until she was nearly 40. um so um it has to be the right person that god wants it's and we're race. trusting for joshua <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> amen he, god has the right woman for him the perfect fit amen well thank you both for today's contribution and uh hopefully we'll be seeing you again before christmas amen and, look uh, forward to it but thanks again, and I hope your floor gets fixed soon, Ian. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So for all of you watching, hopefully we're almost at the end of our concluding episodes about Covenant. But for those of you thinking of marriage, don't be put off by what you're seeing in the world. And certainly don't be put off from your own personal experiences of the past, or even other relationships in your family. Because marriage should only be with the person that God's chosen for you. It might be helpful to also find someone who also believes in God the way that you do. See, what God joins together cannot be separated. And he wouldn't stick you with something that won't be fruitful and beneficial to your life. So for all of you out there seeking love, time to pray and let Lord do the work for you. God bless. If you were blessed by this video, why not give it a like? Also subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon to be notified of future videos.